This is a video summarising the content taught in the second topic of AQA A-Level Chemistry. At GCSE, we referred to this as quantitative chemistry, but we now call this amount of substance, because amount in chemistry means the number of moles. This topic appears in all of the A-Level papers. It's a very calculation heavy topic, so really to revise it, I would recommend doing as many practice questions as possible. A lot of the material is identical to GCSE, particularly if you took GCSE chemistry rather than combined science, in which case you also had to do some calculations like titration. We do have a few new ones though, like back titration and also the ideal gas equation. The first thing I would make sure that you revise is usually taught in the atomic structure topic, but it is referred to in the amount of substance specification too. And that's important because while atomic structure is only in paper one, amount of substance can be examined in either paper. Unlike mass number, which is for one particular atom, relative atomic mass is a figure which takes into account all of the different isotopes of an element, whether that's in the whole world or just in a particular sample, and also their relative abundances. If we have a lot of a particular isotope, then it makes up a greater proportion of the relative atomic mass than a rarer isotope. We can define relative atomic mass as the average mass of one atom of an element compared to one twelfth of the mass of one atom of carbon-12. You can also write this as a mathematical expression, in which case we need two things on the top, the average mass and the atom, and then four things on the bottom. So uh, one twelfth, the mass, the atom, and the carbon 12. You can also express this in terms of moles, so saying the average mass of one mole of atoms of an element, as long as you're also consistent with yourself. So on the bottom, it would have to be a twelfth of the mass of one mole of atoms of carbon 12. There's quite a range of different styles of question that you could be given in which you're asked to either calculate relative atomic mass or use relative atomic mass in order to work out either the mass number or the relative abundance of another isotope. So we're just going to look at one example here. So here we have a sample that contains the isotopes nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. Now you need to notice that where we've been given abundances, these aren't relative abundances, they're just absolute numbers. So therefore, when we put together our expression, we're not going to be dividing by 100, we're going to be dividing by 27 plus 5. And this will give us an answer of 14.2. Whenever you're doing one of these calculations, you want to do a common sense check at the end. So here, my isotopes have masses of 14 and 15, and that means that my final answer needs to be between 14 and 15. It should also be closer to the more abundant isotope. So here, there's much more of nitrogen 14, and therefore my answer is much closer to 14 than it is to 15. The next thing in this first section is relative molecular masses and relative formula masses. Hopefully you're aware that they're basically the same thing, it's just whether we're talking about a molecular substance or something that's, say, ionic. These calculations aren't going to make up a huge amount of your A-level paper, but they're often worth a mark within other calculations like theoretical yield or concentration. So it's worth doing some practice, particularly for compounds that contain compound ions or ligands and then have brackets. So for this example here, we know that vanadium has a relative atomic mass of 50.9, and then carbon, of course, is 12, hydrogen is 1, and oxygen is 16. So I'm going to start out by working out my relative molecular mass of ethanoic acid. So if I add together all of the atoms that are in there, I get a relative molecular mass of 60. And then there are five of these, so 60 times 5 is 300. And then finally, I can add on my vanadium and get 350.9. You've been calculating relative formula masses since the very start of the quantitative chemistry topic in GCSE chemistry. So it might surprise you to know that a lot of students in their A-level exams are losing marks because they write down an incorrect relative formula mass. And the thing is, that's not because they don't know how to work out a relative formula mass, it's because they've got the formula wrong in the first place. So very often at A-level, you'll need to use the relative formula mass of a compound and you'll be given the name of that compound, but not necessarily the symbol formula. Say if you're given calcium hydroxide, you need to know or you need to work out that that's going to be Ca brackets OH brackets 2. So firstly, it's really important that you spend a little bit of time memorising the formulae and also the charges of your compound ions. So we have these five anions that you should know and also ammonium. And secondly, it's important that you spend a bit of time practising putting together these cations and these anions to produce compounds that overall have a neutral charge. 
So say if I wanted to write down a formula for aluminium sulfate, I would look at aluminium with a three plus charge and look at sulfate with a two minus charge and think about what the lowest common multiple of those two numbers is. And of course it's six. And then I need to think, what would I multiply each of those ions by in order to get me to six? So for aluminium, I'd need to multiply it by two and for the sulfate, I'd need to multiply it by three. That means I'm going to need two aluminium ions for every three sulfate ions. So my final formula for that compound is going to be Al2 brackets SO4 brackets 3. The Avogadro constant represents the number of particles in a mole, and that could be the number of atoms, molecules, ions, or even electrons. You can think of a mole like a million. You can have a million people, but you can also have a million families. It doesn't matter what you're looking at, it's just a number that you can apply to any particle. You should be confident using the Avogadro constant to calculate the number of particles in a substance or to work backwards from the relative mass in order to work out the actual mass of one atom or ion or molecule. You should still be able from GCSE to use the relative formula mass together with the number of moles to calculate a mass or equally to use the mass together with the relative formula mass to calculate the number of moles. In all of your A-level chemistry calculations, it's important that you're using an appropriate number of significant figures, which will be the same as the smallest number of significant figures used in the question. At A-level, we no longer talk about concentration in terms of grams per decimeter cubed, and we almost exclusively use moles per decimeter cubed. But you could still be given mass data and expected to use masses Mr. Mole to convert to moles in order to be able to calculate a concentration. The ideal gas equation is everybody's favourite because you can often pick up two really easy marks. One for recalling the equation, or at least recalling one of the rearranged versions of it, and then a second one for converting all of the numbers in the question into the correct units. So make sure you're aware that pressure needs to be in pascals, so you're going to need to multiply it by a thousand if it's given in kilopascals. Volume is in metres cubed, so you often need to divide a value in centimetres cubed by a million. And temperature needs to be in Kelvin, so you may need to add 273 to a temperature that's been given to you in degrees Celsius. Here's an example of quite a straightforward ideal gas equation question. I'm saying it's straightforward because it doesn't really involve any chemistry, it's just mathematical calculations, because we're not being asked to look at a chemical equation and figure out how many moles of some product are going to be made based on how many moles we start with. One thing it is worth noticing is that even though in the ideal gas equation um, we're going to have volume in metres cubed, in this question I've been asked to give my answer in centimetres cubed, and that's entirely normal and natural and happens a lot, so just watch out for it. So my first step is going to be to recall my ideal gas equation, and then I need to rearrange this into an appropriate format, which here is going to be with volume as the subject. Now, in order to be able to complete that calculation, I'm going to need to do some conversion first of some other numbers that are given in the question. So 105 degrees C is going to be 378 Kelvin, and 100 kilopascals is going to be 100,000 pascals. So, so far, I've probably earned two marks, one for my rearranged version of the ideal gas equation, and one for these two conversions put together. Next, I'm going to need to calculate how many moles of ethanol I've got. So I'm going to need the MR, which I can work out as being 46. Sometimes this will be given in the question, just if they're trying to make it worth um, slightly fewer marks. So I can use masses Mr. Mole, rearrange to make moles be the subject, and I do 4 divided by 46 and get 0 0.0869565. Remember, I'm not going to do any early rounding, so it might be really tempting to make that 0 0.087, but if I did that, I'd be introducing some variation in my answer that I just don't want. So I'm going to use that full calculated display, even if I'm not going to write it down. So now I can put all of those numbers into my equation, and that will give me an answer of 0 0.00273146096609 meters cubed. But remember, my question asked for it in centimeters cubed. So I'm going to need to multiply that answer by a thousand. And then I want to think about the fact that all of my um, data in the question are given to three significant figures. So actually, I'm going to round my answer to three significant figures as well. Empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of atoms of each element in a compound. Ionic compounds have a formula that is already an empirical formula, but for a molecular substance, it may or may not be the same thing. For instance, all alkenes have an empirical formula of CH2. To calculate empirical formula from mass data, we're going to start off by using masses Mr. Mole to work out how many moles of each element we have. You rearrange the equation, and then we work out that we've got 0.3 moles of nitrogen and 0.6 moles of oxygen. 
Then we put those together in a ratio and we need to convert this to the simplest whole number ratio, which we do by dividing by the smaller of the two numbers. I divide the left side by 0.3 and then the right side. Don't fall into the trap of dividing both sides by themselves because then you'll just get a one to one ratio. This gives me an answer of one to two and then I need to express my answer as an actual molecular formula, which here is going to be NO2. A different style of question might ask us to first work out the empirical formula and therefore work out the molecular formula. So here we're given a mass of nitrogen and a mass of hydrogen and an overall MR. So I start off in exactly the same way that I would if I was just working out empirical formula. I do 70 divided by 14 to find out that I have 5 moles of nitrogen and 10 divided by 1 to find out that I've got 10 moles of hydrogen. I probably should say that an A-level question is not going to give you numbers that are this nice, but I'm trying to make it straightforward. So if I then put those together as a ratio, I've got 5 to 10. And if I simplify that ratio by dividing both sides by the smallest number, then I'm going to get a simplified ratio of 1 to 2. That means that my empirical formula is NH2, because remember, your empirical formula needs to be written in the same format as a molecular formula. We can't just leave it as a ratio. We need to have the symbols for the elements in there. So then I'm going to think about it as if that were a molecule and say, well, what would the relative formula mass of NH2 be? So 14 plus two lots of one gives me a relative formula mass of 16, but I've got a relative formula mass of 32. So 32 divided by 16 tells me that that empirical formula I've come up with fits in twice. So therefore my molecular formula is going to be the empirical formula I've come up with doubled. In other words, N2H4. To balance equations, start off by writing down the number of atoms of each element on each side. Then look for an element that's not balanced and think about what the lowest common multiple would be. Here I'm going to start with carbon and the lowest common multiple of one and seven is seven. So I need to multiply by adding coefficients and here I'm going to add a seven in front of the carbon dioxide. Next, I'm going to think about the hydrogen and here I'm trying to balance six versus two. So the lowest common multiple is six and therefore I need to add a coefficient of three on the right hand side. Then I'm going to think about oxygen and I've got 17 in total on the right hand side. So I need 17 on the left hand side, but I also need to take account of the two that are in the carboxylic acid. Once I remove those, I'm left with 15 and therefore I need to add seven and a half as a coefficient for the oxygen. Start answering a theoretical yield question by doing your housekeeping and removing anything that's not part of the question and then writing down the MR of the other substances. Use masses Mr. Mole to work out what the number of moles is of the substance that you do have the mass for. So here I'm going to find that I have 0.5 moles of sodium azide. Then I need to look at the coefficients to work out how many moles I have of the second substance. And this is probably the most common thing that students leave out when they're doing these calculations. You divide by the coefficient of the thing you already know about and multiply by the coefficient of the thing you're trying to work out. So I've got 0.75 moles of nitrogen. I then go back to masses Mr. Mole to work out that I've got 21 grams. As well as vanilla theoretical yield questions, you're also going to get some limiting reactant questions. And these might explicitly ask you to write down what the limiting reactant is, or it might just be impossible to give a correct answer without working out what it's going to be first. The way to identify that you're dealing with one of these limiting reactant questions is that in the question, you're given the mass of two of the reactants, not just one. Once you've written down the masses of your two reactants underneath the balanced simple equation, the first thing you need to do is to work out what the relative formula masses of those substances are. So for propane, we can work out that it's going to be 44, and then we can put that together with the 20 grams from the question to work out that we've got about 0.45 moles of propane. Then we're going to look at our oxygen, which has a relative formula mass of 32, and our moles of oxygen is going to be 2.1875. Now, it would be very easy at this point for you to look at that and say, well, oxygen is a bigger number, therefore oxygen must be in excess. But actually, we need to look at our balanced symbol equation and the coefficients in that to figure out how many more times oxygen do we need. So actually, we've got a one to five ratio, and that means if we don't have five times more oxygen, there just isn't enough. So if I've got 0.4545 moles of propane, I need 2.2725 moles of oxygen. And actually, if I compare those numbers, I can see that I haven't got enough oxygen. So it's actually the oxygen that's limiting. Now, in order to calculate the yield, I'm going to use the limiting reactant. So I'm not going to start with my propane. I'm going to start with my oxygen. 
So five moles of oxygen will produce three moles of carbon dioxide. But I don't have five moles, I have 2.1875. So I'm going to divide by five because that's the number of moles of oxygen in the balanced symbol equation and multiply by three because that's the moles of carbon dioxide. And this tells me that I should make 1.3125 moles of carbon dioxide. So now I need a um, relative formula mass in order to go into masses Mr. Mole. And that relative formula mass is 44. So therefore, the mass I'm going to produce is going to be 57.75 grams. And then as with all of these calculations, I'm going to look at my question and say, oh, these numbers are to three significant figures. So therefore, my answer should also be to three significant figures. Atom economy is a measure of what proportion of the reactants I started with actually ended up in my useful product, as opposed to in a byproduct that I can't use. Having a reaction with high atom economy is desirable because it's going to save me money. It's going to mean that resources are better preserved and it's probably going to save energy as well and generally be better for the environment. In addition to balanced symbol equations, you may be asked to write ionic equations and half equations. We'll look at half equations in more detail when we get to the redox topic, but remember that for an ionic equation, you want to start out with your symbol equation, take any ionic substances and break them down into the ions that make them up. So here that would be iron ions and chloride ions, and then magnesium ions and chloride ions. And if something doesn't change oxidation state between the left and the right side, then you remove it because it's a spectator ion and it doesn't need to be included in the ionic equation. In the first part of the first required practical, you make a standard solution. This could be in the context of a calculation based question where you're given a particular volume and concentration and you need to calculate what mass of solute you need. In terms of the method, the first thing we need to do is weigh out the precise amount of solute and we need to know how much solute has been transferred to the solution, not just what was weighed out initially. So either you do the weighing before and after method or you're going to rinse everything into the beaker that you're using to dissolve the solute in. Then you dissolve that solute using some distilled water, stirring it with a glass rod to make sure that everything dissolves fully, and then transfer this solution to a volumetric flask using a funnel. You need to make sure you rinse down all of the glassware you're using with distilled water and that all of those rinsings go into the volumetric flask. You then add more distilled water until the meniscus rests on the calibration line, and you may need to use a dropping pipette in order to do that accurately. You then stopper your volumetric flask and invert it several times to homogenise the solution. This inversion has to happen right at the very end. It's not something that you're doing earlier to make things dissolve. Then in the second part, you're carrying out a titration in order to work out the concentration of an unknown substance, and that's what's going in your conical flask. Before you start, you rinse through your burette, but you can't do this with water because that would dilute the solution that you're then going to put in the burette. So instead, you rinse the burette with the solution that will eventually be going into it. If you're putting sodium hydroxide in your burette, you rinse it with sodium hydroxide. And this removes impurities and also allows you to fill up the jet space at the bottom. The substance that you don't know the concentration of goes in the conical flask to allow you to swirl it without it splashing out. And you measure that using a volumetric pipette. That's to make your volume very precise and also to reduce uncertainty. If it's an acid-based titration, you include an indicator like phenolphthalein or methyl orange. And these are good indicators because they have a very clear, distinct colour change. You titrate until you see the first permanent colour change, repeating that process until you get concordant data, which are titers that are within 0.1 centimetre cubed of each other. We often use a white tile underneath the conical flask in order to allow you to see the colour change more clearly. All of your volumes are measured at eye level, looking at where the meniscus lies, and your most accurate data is going to be calculated when your burette contains a very dilute solution, because this is going to mean that the volume that you add is larger and therefore the percentage uncertainty is smaller. You use a wash bottle to rinse down the sides of the conical flask and the outside of the burette to make sure that any solution that leaves the burette ends up in the chemical reaction and not stuck to the sides of the glassware. It's fine for us to do this because when we calculate the final concentration, we're going to use the volume of 25 centimetres cubed that we originally put in the conical flask. We're not going to use the volume that ends up in the flask. So even though you're adding water, you're not changing that starting volume that is what's being used in the calculation. To assess the percentage purity of a solid, we can't use regular titration. So what we need to do is a chemical reaction first before we perform that titration. And this whole process is called back titration. So for instance, if I take solid calcium carbonate and I react with that with some acid, before I do that reaction, I can calculate the moles of acid in that acid. And what I then do is I take the leftovers and I use that in a titration with sodium hydroxide to work out how many moles of acid are still in that solution. The difference between those two numbers tells me how much acid has been used up in the initial reaction with the calcium carbonate. Thank you very much for watching.
I hope that you found that a useful reminder of all of the different topics covered in Amount of Substance and you're now ready to crack on with a lot of practice questions. If you did find this video useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry content coming soon.